cloud. I'm share screen. Like this. All right, naming the stars, mile markers of an ast of astronomical history. Uh, you know, you might ask why anybody would want to do a program on stars. Uh, and it turns out that uh, <clears throat> how stars have been named over time <laughs> and insightful history uh, into the human fascination with the night sky. Indeed, the story of star nomenclature is an outline, in effect, of the evolution of astronomy. And uh, knowledge of it adds to one's skill as a sky watcher. Uh, for me, you know, if I'm interested in a topic, the best way uh, to uh, learn it and absorb it is to study it and then make a presentation on it. So, hence this presentation. Now, in addition to being a, a humble sort of amateur astronomer, I consider myself a bit of an amateur anthropologist as well. Uh, I'm not claiming, not claiming to be a, a polymath or anything, just a, a more like a broad spectrum dilettante. But at, at any rate, this topic, naming stars, intersects, uh, in my view, uh, between those two interests, astronomy and anthropology. <clears throat> you see, if you postulate, once you postulate that humanity evolved rather than being created whole cloth in an instant, uh, the question immediately arises, as of course we all know it has, what is the essential characteristic that separates humanity and that evolutionary process from the other from the other animals? At what point, in other words, in the evolutionary process can we say our ancestors crossed a line from hominid to human? <clears throat> it was once postulated that that line was marked by the use of tools. Uh, but we uh, now know that that's not true. A lot of animals use and create tools. Uh, well, then it was thought that it was language, but that also has proven to be false. So my humble little uh, theory here is I postulate our ancestors became human when they started naming the stars. You see, other animals are aware, observe, and respond to their environment. The South African dung beetle, for example, has been demonstrated to be able to see and navigate by the Milky Way. They, they actually put little hoods on them and, and studied their, their movements to, uh, to uh, establish that interesting little study. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that the South African dung beetle has no curiosity about the, middle, the Milky Way. What is unique about humans is, is the quest not just to observe and experience the environment, but to understand everything. And a mind that starts naming stars is a mind on a, uh, <clears throat> on a quest to understand them. So I think it makes a pretty good demarcation. Nobody's come up with anything better. Now, whether you buy my proposition that naming stars is the defining characteristic of humanity or not, I think it is undeniable that all our human ancestors have named stars. And I'm pretty sure that no one is ever going to be able to prove any other species on this planet, at least, has done so. For the purpose of this talk, then, we're going to accept my theory that this is true because it makes the talk more important, if nothing else. All right. Now, I got to have a, a, a well, I didn't move my slide, so I just finished that slide, too. <clears throat> So uh, in passing, I just want to, I can't help but note uh, uh, that uh, everything that has brought us the great power to alter our environment, this curiosity it has. Uh, unfortunately, the wisdom to use that power without destroying the environment has not evolved apace with it. As uh, I think this uh, illustration of the uh, 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 growth and light pollution from the 50s uh, into now and, and projected into the future 
illustrates and illustrative of a bigger problem that humans have, but that's a digression. So let's move back uh, to the, uh, the subject at hand in a more direct way. So now, uh, uh, if you are a novice observer, you're probably going to immediately understand or appreciate what I'm get what I'm the point I'm trying to make with this slide. If you're an experienced observer, I ask you to harken back to the days when you first looked at a sky chart uh, similar to this. And if your experience was anything like mine, it was a mixture of uh, uh, curiosity on the one hand, uh, the pull of curiosity, and the uh, 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 push of, uh, of intimidation. Uh, you could look at all of this, and you might spend a minute and start to figure out some things about it. Uh, but pretty soon you say, well, what are these M things with numbers? And what are all these weird so symbols? If you momentarily postulate that must be some kind of naming system for stars, you'll be confused by the fact that you see the same symbols on different stars. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, you know, you look at that a minute and you might, you might say maybe the lawn needs mowing uh, rather than bend your brain anymore trying to figure that out. But if you spend a little time and a little bit of study, you come to realize that it's far worse than that chart implies. This is a slide that gives us a list of all of Cirrus is the brightest star in the sky, all its uh, monikers, all its labeled names, 63 of them. Uh, and this is not unique to Cirrus. Uh, most stars will have uh, uh, very nearly this number of, uh, of uh, uh, as I say, monikers. Now, uh, how in the world and why would you have so many names for a star? How did this come about? Well, it's a consequence of basically two things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you don't, you're naming stars. You're, in, a, in essence, cataloging them, aren't you? And over time, uh, 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 the people cataloging stars initially, uh, just uh, their interest was such that they, they uh, cataloged more and more stars with each passing uh, attempt at it. We go through Hipparchus is the first to catalog, put together a catalog of stars, 850. Uh, but then uh, subsequent people, Ptolemy and Ulabeg and Tycho Brahe, who we'll talk about, uh, uh, and John Flamstein, we'll visit about some of these in their work, uh, catalog more and more stars. And every time you, uh, you, you made a new catalog where you had to assign, and they, and they cataloged them different ways, you had to assign different monikers or different names to them. Uh, and then, of course, the telescope came along and opened a much uh, a deeper view. Uh, a lot more stars could be seen. And this thing has progressed along with the technology all the way up through, you know, Tycho with the satellites and uh, uh, that has, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, catalogs enormous numbers of stars. So each of these catalogs is generated. And then there's another factor, and that is, is as we learned about stars, we began to figure out how to measure different aspects of them. Um, spectrum, uh, proper motion, whether they were double or not, uh, whether they were variable or not, and so forth. And all of these brought about catalogs of their own. So that's in a nutshell how we've uh, come about uh, having all these different names. But before we get uh, further in, into these catalog uh, processes, uh, let's start uh, and back up and recognize that, that uh, uh, proper names that some of the brightest stars have proper names. And, and every civilization, uh, by my definition of humanity, has uh, probably named stars going all the way back. So Cirrus has had an unknown number <laughs> of being the brightest star in the sky. Undoubtedly been not, had a name, but any civilization that could see it. Um, and so it's probably had more proper names then there are visible stars to the naked eye in the sky. Uh, we don't, of course, have a record of all these names, 
but we have a few, and this just illustrates a handful of the known uh, names that Ceres has had uh, in different uh, time frames and different civilizations. Uh, Ceres, the word Ceres that we use today for it, for the first name, uh, is derived from the Greek word for scorching, uh, which you can understand why that would uh, be fitting for the brightest star in the sky. Uh, the uh, Egyptians uh, uh, referred to it as Sopdet, if I pronounce that, probably pronounce that wrong, uh, there, uh, who was a goddess of the uh, fertility of their soil. And the connection here is, is that uh, Sirius would rise uh, in the east uh, uh, just before the Nile uh, would rise each year and bring uh, 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 fertility to the uh, Nile Valley. Um, and you can just go down this this uh, list and see uh, that there have been a lot of names. Dog uh, star is interesting how frequently that shows up. The Chinese call it the celestial wolf. Uh, the Romans call it the uh, canicula, the dog, the little dog. Uh, and the American Indian tribes in their own language uh, typically referred to it as the dog star. And I'm not sure that I can entirely understand uh, why that common across civilizations. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to learn is uh, uh, that most star names uh, come from some characteristic uh, uh, of the star, either in, in terms of an inherent characteristic, such as its brightness in the case of Ceres, or the color in the case of Antares, which means rival of Mars, or the, the variability, the demon star, Algo, uh, or its location, uh, as in the case of Aldebaran, the follower, because it follows the Pleiades, uh, or in its location in a, a constellation, such as Rigel, which means the leg of Orion, or Deneb, which means pale, a lot of Denebs, by the way, uh, in the sky, uh, function. Uh, some stars were named, uh, like Capella, which uh, 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 signs of she-goat uh, uh, based upon the season in which they were up. In this case, it, uh, as I understand it, aligned with the period of time when the shepherds would sleep with their flocks in the field. And a few are named after people. Uh, Cora Caroli is, uh, stands for the heart of Charles. Uh, Charles II, uh, the name was given to the star by um, uh, Newton. Uh, a new uh, constellation had been created. Uh, and, uh, they were filling the stars out in these constellations. Uh, uh, and so he had that opportunity. Uh, Bernard stars uh, named after the fellow that discovered proper motion. And that the star that he did that with is, is, carries his name. Uh, and uh, str strangely, Canopus, I don't know, I have not found uh, why this is the case, but, but uh, uh, King Melanus's uh, fleet navigators named after that star, or or, the, or vice versa. Um, you never, you never know. That may be that the uh, that the uh, uh, Iliad was written uh, used the, the star's name. So, <clears throat> uh, so this is the mechanics about how this, and it's really fascinating about how these names came to us. You may know that most of the star names are Arabic. Uh, so as I mentioned, Hipparchus in uh, uh, about 129 BCE uh, compiled the first known catalog of stars. Uh, and he invented the magnitude system, by the way. Uh, and he made a catalog of 850 uh, stars uh, at, in 48 constellations. Uh, and, and the ancients did not uh, map the whole sky with constellations. They were just the important parts of this, like the, uh, the zodiacs and so forth, the brighter, the polar region and so forth, that they had, uh, that they had their uh, figures in the sky and their imagination. Uh, so that's what he used. He did the 850 stars, uh, and he measured their positions with the exactness. He had a globe of the sky made. Uh, he was uh, he was quite um, uh, a scientist, and 
uh, I found this interesting, particularly interesting. Uh, and when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. I always wondered how these guys could visually estimate. And he created, as I say, he created a magnitude system from first magnitude all the way to sixth magnitude, uh, uh, the concept of it, and, uh, and, and assigned the magnitudes to the stars. How could you do that with the naked eye? How could you judge uh, the brightness of stars and compare them in that way? Well, it, it turns out, of course, when they don't know what a star is, right? Uh, and it turns out the word magnitude refers to size. Uh, and when you think about it, uh, brighter stars appear bigger. And the, for all they knew, all the stars were the same distance away. Some might just be bigger than others. Uh, but at any rate, that's what he did. He was measuring, he was judging them based upon, uh, probably based upon their size, given that he assigned the term magnitude to them. So anyway, uh, Ptolemy comes along about 300 years later, and uh, he's uh, uh, very interested in, in, in the sky. Uh, it was a common fascinated for, fascination for a lot of reasons in these uh, uh, periods because they uh, people intuitively understood that that had that uh, those stars and the night sky had to be important and be tied into important things and they were particularly interested in position more than they were anything else uh, but frankly they couldn't measure much of anything else anyway so uh, he cataloged 122 stars including the 850 that Hipparchus uh, had cataloged he was aware of Hipparchus's catalog. And he, in fact, he compared his measurements and he explored the concept of proper motion. Um, now his catalog of 12, of 122 stars uh, was just a tiny part of the work. It was an eight book uh, project all together with a lot of, uh, of the math uh, involved in astronomy at the time and analysis of that. and. Uh, um, and so forth. I, I, I couldn't, I don't remember the titles of each book or its purpose, but the, the catalog was just a small element that was essential to it, uh, but not the whole thing. And this is called the, um, the Almagest. And uh, it was translated into Arabic in the eighth and ninth centuries by Arab scholars. This would have been during the Middle Ages when, uh, when science sort of went into a lull in the uh, in Europe, uh, and um, uh, but the uh, uh, Arabs had a, uh, a, a, a scientific renaissance of their own during that period of time, and they were uh, aware of of uh, Ptolemy's uh, catalog, uh, who, by the way, was uh, uh, a Greek uh, um, uh, Egyptian. They lived in Alexandria. Ptolemy did, so they translated it. Uh, uh, and then uh, later uh, in Europe, uh, it was uh, the Arab translation was then translated into Latin. Uh, and because Ptolemy was not giving, he didn't have names for a thousand stars, uh, and he wasn't in the business of giving them names. So the way he the way he identified them was to was to refer to where they were in relation to the constellation they were in, the same 48 constellations that Hipparchus was using. So, you, for example, you get the tail star and uh, Eridanus, the Ptolemy's river in, uh, becomes uh, Acura in Nahar, as the, <laughs> I'm stumbling over it, in Arabic translation. And then when that is Latinized uh, in the 12th century, it becomes Akmar. Uh, so this is how this, this, we've gotten these Arabic names. The, uh, the Arabs simply translated, uh, Ptolemy's Greek, uh, description of the location in the constellation. Uh, and then, uh, those were then late, later Latinized and you end up with what amounts to, uh, Arabic root, uh, names, uh, names rooted in Arabic. So just a few examples here in Arcturus. Uh, Chai Arcturus is to Tula, what, which means a water jar. Uh, and Theta uh, is uh, uh, Anka, 
which means hip bone. And so you can see how that fits into the uh, into the constellation. And delta uh, is a scat, which means shin. And on the left is a chart that just a small clip of a website, which the title of the uh, URL is up there at the top. Uh, that goes through and and interprets all these uh, names for you if you're interested. It's it's fascinating, but that's how this came about. Now <clears throat> we turn now to an interesting character, uh, Tycho Brahe. And let me get my notes to make sure I don't skip anything that I want to talk about here. Uh, So uh, <clears throat> when Copernicus uh, writes his uh, uh, tome on celestial mechanics and his theory about the layout of the uh, universe and the solar system, he's actually using Ptolemy's catalog. So Ptolemy's catalog was in use for like 1,600 years um, until we get to uh, the uh, late 16th century, middle to late 16th century in Tycho, who is not probably as uh, much uh, of a popular figure as he probably ought to be in terms of the importance of his work. Uh, he was a, um, uh, you know, a uh, noble. A lot of these people are either priests or nobles, the early science, they've got the time to devote to their esoteric studies. Um, uh, his father wanted him to be a lawyer. He was uh, uh, supposed to be studying law, uh, but along the way, he fell in love with astronomy. Uh, and uh, part of how that happened, there was a, a, a partial solar eclipse uh, that was predicted, and he witnessed that and it caught his fancy and he became interested in this whole idea because there were ephemera at the time. and uh, they weren't as very accurate. Uh, and there was a constellation of Jupiter and Saturn uh, where he got his hands on all the information he could about the predicted um, conjunction of those two planets. And, and all of them were grossly in error, uh, several, some by several days. And uh, so he got this bee in his bonnet. He got into astronomy. He would do his astronomy at night. He had a tutor. Uh, when his tutor would sleep, he would do his astronomy. Uh, and he ultimately abandoned the law and became full-time into astronomy. And he set out to measure his original goal was to measure the orbits of the planets in great detail because uh, he was convinced that uh, only by, by uh, a careful measurement of their, uh, uh, of their motions in the sky over a prolonged period of time could we finally really figure out uh, how <clears throat> how things uh, worked. Um, you know, at the time they had these theories, the Aristotelian theories uh, were that the planets were on epicycles and they went around and and that explained the periods of time when they seemed to go backwards and, and so forth. And that all the stars were fixed and, and totally unchanging uh, beyond anything beyond the planet and the moons was utterly and completely fixed and nothing ever new. It's always a status, steady, steady, steady state uh, concept of the universe. Uh, and Tycho doing his work discovered a supernova and he documented thoroughly that it was not a comet uh, or any other explanation, but it was in fact a new star. And that exploded this whole Aristotelian, finally. Uh, so this is a, he's a central figure in the Renaissance of astronomy. Uh, his then his catalog goes on and one of his uh, assistants was Kepler and Kepler uh, took the measurements, took his measurements and, uh, and worked out his uh, laws of planetary motion. Uh, but getting back to catalogs and star names, I've digressed uh, grossly here. Uh, all of that is to bring us to Uranometria and Johann uh, Bayer's uh, Uranometria. So here he is in Tycho's time. Tycho has measured all these stars 
he's put Tycho put them in a catalog, but uh, Bayer wanted to publish uh, a chart or charts, uh, and he uh, was felt the need to somehow title or name these stars, uh, you know, and to be able to do so in ways that everybody that who was interested in them could share the same the same names and. It, uh, and so what he did was, in the uh, and he cataloged uh, 1,200 stars. He came up with this theory or this concept where uh, he would name uh, uh, use the Greek letters to uh, name uh, the stars in each constellation, starting with Alpha as the brightest star and Beta with the next brightest, and so forth, uh, uh, going down by order of magnitude. Uh, through the Greek letters, and then when he ran out of Greek letters, I mean, we got 1,200 stars here that divided up into a number of constellations, I think uh, 60, because he added 12 new southern ones. Um, uh, he would run out of Greek letters, so he used capital Roman letters next, and then he used lowercase uh, Roman letters. Uh, and this became the uh, uh, chart for uh, uh, and, and a catalog of star positions and star names uh, for uh, a, a considerable period of time uh, <clears throat> until we come to uh, Flamstein's catalog in 1725. Now, here's the thing. He was the astronomer royal in Britain. Uh, his problem with Bayer's concept, uh, besides the fact that he wanted to do more stars, uh, and so therefore he had to have his own catalog, was that it was uh, just from a technical standpoint, it was objectively difficult to rank stars by their brightness as you got dimmer. Uh, it became an increasing challenge to discern which star was brighter than what star. It was really a cumbersome process and very difficult and, uh, and ambiguous. And so he came up with an alternative concept and that was he would just start numbering them uh, from uh, west to east. Uh, and he did that for each constellation. Uh, and um, uh, that became the, the Flamstein system. Uh, now, interestingly, he didn't, he, <laughs> uh, Newton and I think Haley published his catalog before he wanted it cataloged, before he wanted it pu published. Uh, and he actually went out and bought up like 300 copies, if my memory serves, uh, 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 of, of the, what, they, what they had had printed up of his uh, catalog. Uh, and when he actually did publish his catalog, he didn't put the numbers in. Uh, a French astronomer came along and put the numbers back in that, Newton and, uh, uh, that Newton's publication had included. So at any rate, after this point in time, now we've got the Bayer system, and now we've got a Flamstein system. So what, what happens is, is that the Bayer system, insofar as it uses Roman uh, numbers, uh, fades away. But the Greek letter uh, system, which covers the very brightest stars in each constellation, remained in use. And Flamstein's uh, naming system uh, became the uh, the means for labeling stars that didn't qualify for the Greek letters in the Bayer system. So now you've got proper names. You've got proper names that the from the uh, the process I described earlier for uh, like twelve hundred star, star uh, thousand twenty two stars. Uh, you've got the Greek letter system, uh, and um, and you've got the Flamstein system. Now. Of course, as I say, along comes the telescope, right? And indeed, with the glass uh, Galileo uh, quote here on the right from Galileo 1610, indeed, with the glass, you will detect below stars of the sixth magnitude such a crowd of others that escape natural sight that is hardly believable. The largest of these we may designate as of the seventh magnitude. So here in 1610 is the first indication that the magnitude system is going to go beyond what Hipparchus 
and and Ptolemy had uh, had used. Um, and on the left side is interesting that this uh, uh, bezel is uh, noting that certain stars are wobbling uh, in place, and he concludes they've got to have companions, even though you can't see them. Uh, and he said he he notes we have no reason to suppose that luminosity is a necessary property of cosmic body of cosmological bodies. The visibility of countless stars is no argument against the invisibility of countless other ones. So I just got that caught my attention. But the bottom line about all this is the telescope comes along, and all of a sudden our catalogs are going to start exploding, right? Uh, and that happens with the Bonner Dirchmonsterung. Uh, survey that is uh, begun uh, in 1859 by F.W.A. Arglander uh, at the Bonn Observatory. He's got a 78 millimeter refractor, so you know you're talking about three inch telescope. Um, and he sets out to catalog uh, and and measure the uh, estimate the magnitude and measure the position of every star that he can see with that telescope, which basically goes down to uh, 9.5 magnitude and consists of 324,188 stars. <laughs> you know, dedication and focus is a big part of becoming famous in anything, I think. Dedication and focus, think about that. Now, he actually had assistants that did a lot of that work. And what they would do is they would start in one degree bands. So his his naming system is one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth uh, through uh, 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 I think it's yeah one degree bands, uh, and he did that all the way down to minus one degree uh, declination, uh, and then uh, they supplemented that to get southern stars with a catalog that uh, abbreviates SBD, Southern Bonner Dirchmannstrom, uh, uh, which went down to minus 23 degrees and added another 134,000 uh, stars almost. And then a, another survey done even further south that added uh, uh, over 600,000 stars for a total of 1,071,800 stars. Uh, and these stars, the catalogs for these are, uh, are a DM, the letters capital DM, and then a number. And that number is, um, uh, is as I said, a west to east within these one degree bands. So v Vega is BD plus 38. That means it lies between 37 and 38 degrees north, and it's the 3,238 star. Uh, going from west to east. Uh, <clears throat> so now we've got these historic uh, uh, catalogs in place with over a million stars, uh, but there's more. Uh, you know, as I indicated earlier, part of this explosion in star names come from the technology of being able to see, but the other part is learning about them, and then you want to catalog them by their characteristics. And so you need names uh, uh, for these stars. So variable stars, for example. Uh, uh, in variable stars, Bayer's Greek letter remains in use for those stars that have Greek letter names. But then uh, you start using capital Roman letters starting with R. Uh, and the two letters, uh, uh, and then once you run out of single letters, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, then you go back to two letters, starting with R, 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 S, et cetera. And after you run out of that, uh, you start with double Z, it doubles back. After you've gotten the double Z, you double back to A, 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 B, et cetera, at omitting J. Uh, and then after A, Z, the letter V and a number. So. Uh, v335 is the 335th uh, brightest variable in the constellation that you're referring to. In all of these cases, this is tied to the constellation. 
So it's uh, 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 R Cygnus or RR Cygnus, et cetera, uh, just like the Bayer numbers, which are linked to constellation, and uh, the Flemstein numbers, which are linked to constellation. So uh, then you got supernovas. So each year, uh, uh, the names for supernovas are SN, followed by a year of discovery, followed by the next available capital letter for that year. Then two lowercase letters in order of AA, AB, et cetera. Double stars, uh, you use a subscript uh, in the early days. You have two really close stars. You, they would just assign a subscript of one or two uh, with the one being uh, assigned to the Western component and two to the easternmost rather than the brightness. Uh, more common is the use of ABC uh, in the modern uh, uh, situation. So you've got a, uh, 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 let's see, uh, Cirrus is a, is a multiple star. So you've got Cirrus A and Cirrus B. And I think there's also a Cirrus C. And then you have your catalog designations that I've been referring to. The, the prefix, like the DM that I mentioned earlier, designation for the catalog and whatever system is using to ID each star in the catalog, usually keyed on its con uh, coordinates in some way. So what are some of the uh, uh, specialized catalogs that, that uh, have given stars names? Well, spectroscopic classification, uh, 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 the Henry Draper catalog, you'll see these. When you go into any kind of uh, database kind of system, you'll run into these, these uh, names that I'm that I'm 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 uh, listening with you about the BDs the, and the HD here uh, and and uh, the Bayer system you'll see these uh, uh, listed for uh, the stars if you click on them uh, and the Henry Draper catalog was I believe the first big catalog to come out and and catalog stars by their spectral type when they learned how to do spectrum uh, and then it grew over time and so you got these extensions you can see there in the slide. Uh, double stars are now uh, cataloged. There have been a lot of historic catalogs, uh, BDS for Burnham's, ADS for Aitken. These were people who were early pioneers in studying of double, double stars. But today they're all in the Washington double star catalog, uh, which has a huge amount of information on each star, including, I think, uh, their Flemstein numbers and, and, and so forth. And that catalog, by the way, is updated every night. So as additional information comes in, uh, they update uh, that catalog. And then you have uh, proper motion catalogs and carbon star catalogs and so forth. So basically this catalog thing has exploded into a, uh, a near uh, a, a approaching infinity, uh, particularly now with uh, uh, Hipparchus, uh, Tycho, uh, satellites uh, that are doing uh, astrometry of stars in huge volumes. So here's a summary of star nomenclature because we've gone through a lot. You've probably gotten confused. We, for uh, some stars and not a great many, there are uh, recognized proper names. Uh, most of Ptolemy's, uh, uh, the names that came, the proper names that came out of Ptolemy's catalog are not recognized in, uh, nor in, in use. Proper names are really only for the brightest stars in, in terms of common use. If you look up, a, if you refer to a star, uh, uh, if it's a Cirrus or a Vega, or something like that, that's how it's gonna be referred to. But otherwise, going down in, in magnitude, uh, Bayer is what you're gonna see next. And then if you get dimmer than the Greek letters, you're gonna see the Flamstein uh, numbers. And if you get beyond the 1200 or 2900 stars that Flamstein catalog, uh, you're going to see the DM numbers uh, as, the, as the primary way of, uh, of, uh, of naming or referring to a particular star. But in these catalogs, these digital catalogs, you'll see probably see all these. They'll give you all these. The Draper, the HD number, Bright Star catalog, um, the Bright Star catalog is uh, uh, comes with an HR and a number, and this is uh, all the uh, the uh, 
this is originally the Harvard uh, catalog, if I remember correctly. Uh, then it became the Yale Bright Star Catalog. Now it's just called the Bright Star Catalog. And it is limited to the stars that are presumably visually observable with a naked eye. And so it's got about uh, 6,000 stars in it. And about everything that you might think to put in a catalog about a star is in there. So they're quite a comprehensive spectral type, proper motion, so forth and so on. Then you've got the Smithsonian Catalog, SAO. Uh, and it goes down to 9.5 magnitude and is also uh, uh, quite uh, uh, comprehensive. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, the names there are similar to uh, 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 the, uh, the German catalog, the uh, Dirtschmannstrunger, in that it has a, uh, it works off of uh, right ascension and declination bands uh, as to how they uh, line them up. It's, uh, it's an order of right ascension in each declination band. So like here you got, I'm referring to here, 18 would mean 18 degrees north, uh, and then you have a, a west to east number. And then the Washington catalog um, uses a J plus five digits for the right ascension of the star and four digits for its declination. So they just literally used uh, the, uh, the coordinate for the star as the name of the star. Uh, and then you've got Hipparchus, you'll see that as HIP in a number, which is also right ascension derived. So uh, finally, uh, and by the way, uh, in these uh, Tycho uh, catalogs and Hipparchus catalogs, uh, you're talking, I uh, misplaced my notes here. I'm not going to take the time to dig it out, but you're talking uh, over a million uh, stars. Let's see. Uh, uh, well, it's a lot of stars <laughs> that they have documented down to thousands of a uh, thousands of them of a uh, of a minute in accuracy uh, it's the latest stuff and they use these catalogs for navigating satellites and so forth so finally so we've sort of walked our way through this whole thing but then in 2016 the international astronomical uh, uh, union, which is responsible for, for uh, you can't buy a star name, by the way, if you run into that on the internet, it's a fraud, um, responsible for uh, the official monikers and keeping up with how stars are, are named and referred to, uh, uh, decided that we need to go back and tap some of the other um, civilizations uh, and add uh, star names from other civilizations uh, to the official list of stars with proper names. Um, and so they, uh, from Aboriginal Australians and Chinese, and Coptics and Hindus and Mayans, Polynesians and South Africans and American Indians, uh, they gathered a star, uh, the last I was able to find a number for 330 stars. And this website up here, you can find those by the way. So a, a total of 330 stars have recognized proper names that, uh, by the International uh, Astronomical Union. And that is my talk. Uh, any questions? I'm going to stop sharing. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. That was very interesting. <laughs> Maybe I had a hard time wanted, hearing it. Maybe, maybe more than you wanted to know about naming stars. You know, um, I think on Double Star Catalog, uh, Her John Herschel did like 850, 480. 800, he did a large number of double stars. So that he recorded their positions and everything. I'm sorry, guys. That's all right. That's why I had it on mute and everything for the hour and a half. 
I understand. All right. No questions. Man, I covered it all, did I? I can't hear you, Jeff. I have to unplug my headphones to be heard. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. Yeah, but I can't hear you, so that's the problem. Um, at any rate, um, my take on it is I kind of like Hipparchus the best, and then, uh, you know, just write ascension and declination after that. It seems to me like, you know, and then we've got all these traditional proper names, which seem to work pretty well. Yeah, the only drawback to the right ascension declination is, of course, they've changed. <laughs> and that's the reason that J number is in the in the Washington Double Star Catalog. It refers to the epoch uh, at which those numbers uh, work, as I, if I appreciate it correctly. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, were you able to, you, you, Jeff, you said you had a, a hard time hearing it and so did Rocky. I hope the audio was, was good enough that uh, they were. I, can, loud and clear. I can hear you fine when I have headphones in, but I can't hear you without the headphones. Oh, and I then see. I can't speak to you when my headphones are in. I got you. <laughs> All right. Good night, guys. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Chris, Sean.